welcome to Science with Tal. In today's video, I want to go over a very recent publication titled Synapse-Specific Burst Coding Sustained by Local Axonal Translation. This new molecular study by researchers Hovi Wong, Jesper Gerstrom, and Alana Watt uncovers new features on protein synthesis in neurons that drastically change the status quo. To briefly summarize the study before I get into the details, the research team discovered that axons of neurons can make their own protein-building blocks to support burst, or in other words, high-frequency neurotransmission. Additionally, they found that this axonal protein synthesis is specific to certain types of synapses. In this video, my goal will be to present some of the key lines of evidence that led to these conclusions and also to contextualize the importance of their discovery. First, it is important to understand the context surrounding the research to appreciate why the team worked on this topic. When we consider the neurons that make up the brain, they communicate with each other through specialized contact sites called synapses. A synapse involves two neurons, a presynaptic neuron that releases neurotransmitters from its axon and a postsynaptic neuron that receives the chemical signals often on its dendrites. The proper transmission between the neurons requires the maintenance of a wide diversity of synaptic proteins, including receptors, structural proteins that hold the synapse together, and many more. In the textbook view, cells produce proteins in their cell body and transport them where they are needed. Neurons, however, can have very long axons, ranging from millimeters to meters, that are used to communicate with other cells. Given that signal transmission happens very fast, how neurons deliver proteins to the right place and at the right time, this far away from the cell body, is the question at the core of this research. The first important line of evidence of the study comes in Figure 2 and looks into the role of protein synthesis during neurotransmission by considering what happens if protein synthesis is either blocked in the presynaptic cell or the postsynaptic cell. In this experiment, the research group was able to find a reciprocal connection between two pyramidal neurons, one that we will label PC1 in blue, and the other as PC2 in green. Now, before we discuss what manipulations were made by the research team, I want to briefly introduce how the researchers went about to study these cells. So, in essence, the primary technique that was used was the whole cell patch clamp, which allows the experimenters to fully control and record the electrical activity happening in these cells. As such, if we consider the synapse from PC1 to PC2 and the plot of the membrane potential in PC2, the activation of the synapse will produce an electrical signal in PC2 that the experimenters will be able to read thanks to the patch clamp. When stimulated by excitatory neurotransmitters, the signal is also known as an excitatory postsynaptic potential, or simply EPSP. If the postsynaptic neuron is repeatedly stimulated, we can plot the amplitude of the EPSPs over time and continue this for many trials. Typically, experiments have a baseline period where EPSPs are recorded with no manipulation and then an experimental period that follows with an applied protocol. One way to represent these results, which will be used across all the electrophysiological evidence that I will show, is to represent the baseline as this dotted line and the experimental EPSPs as this blue line. Finally, I want to mention very quickly that all the neurons in this study are stimulated at high frequency, which in the paper they call burst transmission. Now, going back to the experiment, I will remind you that the goal is to observe, in this reciprocal connection, the effects of a protein synthesis block on the presynaptic and postsynaptic cells. To block protein synthesis, one of the two neurons, in this case PC1, was loaded with a protein synthesis blocker. As a result, protein synthesis is inhibited postsynaptically in the green to blue connection and presynaptically in the blue to green connection. If we first consider the case in which the green neuron synapses onto the blue neuron, which has protein synthesis inhibited postsynaptically, the transmission remains stable, which can be seen from the fact that the responses remain similar to the baseline. However, if we look at the reverse connection of the same cells, that is, with protein synthesis inhibited presynaptically, transmission is suppressed. Ultimately, this shows that protein synthesis in the presynaptic cell is important in burst neurotransmission. Although promising, this result does not tell us anything about where this protein synthesis might occur. The researchers needed further evidence to determine if protein synthesis occurred in the axon which is the core question they tried to elucidate in the experiment illustrated in Figure 5. The first hint that protein synthesis might occur in the axon came using live imaging, with which they were able to observe an increase in protein synthesis at axon terminals during neurotransmission. But yet again, more proof was still needed. 
If we consider again a synapse between two pyramidal cells, with PC1 in yellow and PC2 in green, causality can be tested by isolating the axon. To do so, the research team used a very precise laser to cut the axon and thus isolate it during neurotransmission. If we look at the strength of connection by stimulating the axon after the cut, you will notice that the postsynaptic responses remain very stable. By itself, this suggests that there is a high autonomy in the axon to support neurotransmission. However, when we instead consider the same scenario but with a protein synthesis blocker added into the mix, the postsynaptic responses diminish if the axon cannot properly synthesize proteins. Together, these results provide strong support for the idea that protein synthesis happens locally in axons to sustain neurotransmission. Now, if, according to these results, the axon plays a role in protein synthesis to support neurotransmission, the researchers expected RNAs to be found in axons and indeed, by live imaging RNA in axons, they saw many RNA stably docked. One surprising observation that the team noticed was the fact that not all presynaptic sites had RNA, which might indicate that presynaptic protein synthesis is specifically needed for some synapses. To test this idea of synapse specificity, which is illustrated in figure 7, the research group considered this complex system where they have one pyramidal cell in green, one basket cell in yellow, and one Martinotti cell in red that all receive a connection from a pyramidal cell in purple. It's important to note that basket and Martinotti cells are inhibitory neurons and drastically differ from the excitatory pyramidal cells in terms of morphology and function. In addition to this, the system was washed in a protein synthesis blocker that affected all cells. As such, this system has distinct types of synapses that can be studied with protein synthesis blocked in the presynaptic cell. With this setup, the team can now, in the same fashion as the other experiments, test what happens to the strength of connection when each synapse type is stimulated. If we first consider the synapse between the two pyramidal cells, we can see that with presynaptic block protein synthesis, the strength of connection diminishes as seen in the previous results. Now, what is surprising is that when we consider both synapses onto basket cells and Martinotti cells, presynaptic protein synthesis block does not impact the strength of connection. This result illustrates that presynaptic protein synthesis to support burst transmission is specific to certain types of synapses. In addition to these electrophysiological lines of evidence, the group also discovered that protein synthesis in the presynaptic neuron was tied to a pathway involving presynaptic and MDA receptors and the kinase by the name of mTOR. Beyond the molecular advances, this research has great implications on our understanding of how memories are shaped, as burst transmission that was used throughout this study has been known to lead to memory formation. Consequently, in the clinical setting, the discovery of this presynaptic mechanism can help create new avenues to better understand and treat memory-related neuropathologies such as Alzheimer's disease. Thank you for watching this video. If there was anything unclear or there was a mistake somewhere in the video, make sure to let me know in the comment section. If you enjoyed this video and found it useful, you can consider leaving a like and subscribing to support the channel. I want to give a special thanks to the authors of this research for the support and guidance they provided me while making this video. If you are interested in learning more about their study, the link will be in the description. Thank you again for watching and I'll see you in our next discussion.